Okay, move out. I'm Lieutenant Jim Joyella, your host on this issue of Your Army Reports. Your Army is making news all over the world, and to bring you some of those stories firsthand, cameramen are at work in many parts of the globe. Today's program begins with the ceremonies merging the 1st and 2nd United States Armies under one new headquarters at Fort George G. Meade, Maryland. A visit with a sergeant missile unit and a ride with a river patrol boat in Korea. Next, we take a look at the 1st Cavalry Air Mobile Division Base at An Khe, Vietnam, with its many activities which keep the helicopters flying and the division truly mobile. We also go along on a search and destroy operation. And finally, we attend an encampment with young college men from all over our country during a reserve officers training course session in Kentucky. All on today's program of Your Army Reports. New York City's historic landmark, Governor's Island, has been the headquarters of the first United States Army since 1946. Now, due to consolidation for economy and efficiency of military facilities throughout the country, jurisdiction of first and second U.S. armies comes under a single headquarters. Military and civilian dignitaries attend the last official ceremony of the old First Army on Governor's Island, bringing to an end an eventful 19-year period. During the retreat ceremony, a 15-gun salute from a battery of 105mm howitzers is followed by a stentorian blast from one of the Civil War siege guns mounted on the old fort wall. Enlisted men lower the flag from the fort's principal staff. The flag will later be taken to the new headquarters at Fort Meade. The first army band ends the program by playing Old Lang Syne. The new headquarters at Fort George G. Meade is designated First United States Army. The 13,000 acre installation is located between Baltimore, Maryland and Washington, D.C. The Honor Guard takes part in this historic ceremony, establishing the first United States Army headquarters at Fort Meade and inactivating the present Second Army. The new First Army will administer the activities of Army installations in 15 eastern states. A firing battery of four cannons as well as color bearers for the 15 state flags in the District of Columbia take part in the ceremony. The First Army Band plays at their new headquarters as the troops pass in review. Lieutenant General William F. Train assumes command of the 1st Army Headquarters at Fort George G. Meade. Also in Maryland, at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, new Army vehicles are undergoing intensive tests, 
over an obstacle course of high curbs, steep depressions, rough dirt roads, barely visible trails, and mud, unimproved by human engineering. This five-ton general purpose cargo and personnel truck is designed to operate over inland waterways as well, without special preparations. A wide variety of wheel and track vehicles is continually being subjected to endurance tests in order to determine if they meet the high performance standards required of Army transport. Water is no barrier to a vehicle equipped with inflatable rubber seals and air pressurized components. Nor does axle deep soft mud stop these six wheels from their forward drive on the Aberdeen test course. Mad made staggered bumps impose stress on suspension and steering parts in this torture test. Field proofing of vehicles designed to deliver combat troops and their heavy equipment to virtually any battle zone in the world. Huge transport planes touch down at an overseas landing strip as part of a 7th Army exercise to demonstrate the mobility of Army hardware in a missile age. Out of the cargo bays emerge trucks carrying the Sergeant missile components. They unload and move to the launching site immediately under their own power. Working against time in a simulated attack situation, the crew swings the gantry into place and begins assembling the four missile components. Men of the unit work on loading the essential, complex equipment needed to fire the weapon. The rocket motor section is carefully mated to the guidance section by knowing hands. When the sections are in place and inspected, additional checks are made. The warhead with the missile payload is affixed and precision adjustments effected. At the communications van, computer crew members review the data and prepare for the firing countdown. The sergeant missile is then erected. The last telemetric sightings are made and all personnel are cleared from the launch area. Now it's seconds to the blast off. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire! Destruction on the way to a distant simulated enemy target. The other batteries let loose with their deadly accurate fireworks. An impressive show by ever alert missile units of the U.S. Army. Incheon Harbor in Korea is a busy place. American military police are working together with the Koreans to protect property and guard against subversion along the river. Near the 38th parallel in South Korea, these high-powered patrol craft are a permanent part of the Incheon Harbor Sea. Because large ships must be anchored well out in the shallow harbor, there's a great deal of small boat activity between the harbor and the shore. 
which requires constant alertness on the part of the joint United States and Korean military patrol. They inspect and control shipping and keep the harbor traffic moving. Bordering the coastline are numerous islands and inlets which provide bases for craft engaged in illegal operations such as smuggling contraband. The United States military policemen working with a Republic of Korea Marine Sergeant set their course toward any suspicious craft. However, most of the boats boarded proved to be on routine journeys and possessed valid identification papers. These local fishermen are bringing their fish into the port and carrying foodstuffs back to their villages. Their papers in order, they are soon on their way again. The Incheon River has one of the highest tides in the world, which adds to the turbulence of the water. And the patrol crewmen have to be expert mariners in addition to their police duties. The end of their tour of duty, but not of the round-the-clock activities of the Inchon River Harbor Patrol. The 1st Air Cavalry Division is implementing the air mobility concept in Vietnam. At An Khe, the 1st Air Cav has established a highly sophisticated base of operations which includes facilities for major maintenance of all military helicopters. The division is a busy outfit. The maintenance work on aircraft is carried out in shops, in tents, and on rollaway engine stands out of doors. The adjustment of assemblies to the required tolerances is intricate work for the aircraft mechanics. Top maintenance keeps these workhorse cargo copters flying. The big CH-47 Chinooks can deliver everything from combat ready troops to field artillery. One of the most interesting helicopters in service with the division is the Sikorsky CH-54A, or flying crane, which was designed to airlift the heaviest materials and offers a variety of cargo handling accessories. On this particular mission, a damaged aircraft is being transported from Anke Airfield to a fixed wing aircraft shop for repair. Here you get an idea of what it's like to transport a heavy free swinging load. Outside a powertrain shop at the Anke base, Mechanics install a hot in on the UH-1D engine. In addition to the major maintenance carried out here in the shop area, mechanics handle regular servicing and assembly on the flight line. The setting of the rotor head on its mast is an exacting task. The maintenance shops are completely equipped with the best available tools of the trade to enable these skilled men to accomplish their mission. When the maintenance is completed, each aircraft undergoes rigid final testing before returning to flight duty. But the prime mission of the division is to take the fight to the enemy, and the UH-1D combat assault helicopter is capable of packing a terrific wallop. These rockets are one answer to the problem of eliminating Viet Cong snipers once their positions are pinpointed. In this action, helicopter support fire has been requested by ground units encountering Viet Cong resistance. The chopper moves in close and strafes the area with machine gun and rocket fire. A demonstration of 1st Air Cavalry Division firepower mobility in the Vietnam War.
Early this year, elements of the 1st Infantry Division began Operation Buckskin in an area north of Saigon. Airstrikes against enemy areas preceded the tank and infantry attack as they moved in for the assault. Three days after Operation Buckskin got underway, these units were filmed on a sweep through the VC stronghold. The main purpose of the operation was to clear the area of an estimated battalion of Viet Cong. The firepower and shock action of M48 tanks and armored personnel carriers were brought to bear against the enemy. This clearing action took place in a province which has long been an area of Viet Cong entrenchment. combat, resupply missions were flown by helicopter. The five-day operation included many resupply missions and the evacuation of light casualties. Armor and fighting men of the 1st Infantry Division moved forward in their relentless pursuit of an elusive enemy. Young men who have just completed junior college or two years of study in a college or university may apply for the Army's new two-year ROTC program. If selected, they take a six-week ROTC basic training course, which is the equivalent of the first two years of the standard ROTC program. These young men leaving for Army training are wondering what their six-week ROTC summer will be like. Marching, yes. Hand grenades, surely. Bivouac, absolutely. It will be tough going, but these college men are confident that they can take it in their stride, that they will learn how to be able soldiers and future officers. Participation is virtually nationwide, and the 247 campuses on which ROTC is offered represent a near roll call of the academic world. Though evidence of university allegiance remains visible, a subtle change in loyalty is introduced from the first day, when each student receives his military clothing issued. In place of old ivy, the men quickly realize they are a part of something actually bigger. They are members of a team that has won and preserved our freedom. They are a part of an efficient organization. Fort Knox, Kentucky is typical of an army post where basic ROTC summer training is given. And this tank, which crosses a stream underwater, is characteristic of the modern army equipment used in the instruction. The M14 rifle is issued at the very start, and the rifle and the student become inseparable friends before summer training is over. To learn the meaning of being an officer is to first understand the soldier's basic military weapon. First attempts at army drill are sometimes awkward but the students shape up in a matter of days. Drill instructors, many of them with experience in both peacetime training and in combat, stand ready to teach and to demonstrate such basic soldiering skills as close order drill, which must be learned correctly from the very beginning.
The individual attention given by the instructors pays off in the high-level future performance of these young officer trainees, when they themselves will assume the responsibilities of leadership. Physical conditioning is also introduced in the early stages of the six-week program. Individual defensive skills are taught and practiced. The change from the halls of a university to army life is perhaps acute, but it requires concentration as intense as that in any classroom. The future ROTC cadet will find himself exposed to a long series of tests and challenges designed to measure his ability. The reward here on the firing line is the excitement of hitting a target. The highly qualified officers and non-commissioned officers assigned to each company teach the students a variety of military subjects. The objective of the six-week course is to develop those qualities essential to effective leadership. The future officer must be able to march, shoot, and maintain his equipment better than any man who will ever serve under him. Whether it is a course in close order drill, hand-to-hand -hand combat, or the platoon in the attack, all are skills today's Army officers must master if others are to rely on their judgment. A student's performance is evaluated at various stages during the training cycle. Item by item, the human puzzle is put together in order to make a fair judgment about each man's future military potential. Map reading, developing the ability with which to chart terrain, is crucial to an officer's confidence, for lives obviously can hang on the decisions he makes. It becomes clear at this stage of the training that soldiering is an exacting craft, demanding more than perfunctory application. The word is rugged, underlined, but it's satisfying, especially when the student can make his body work for him. It's the most intensive on-the-job training anywhere. Infiltration course is a down-to-earth exercise in courage, stamina, and common sense. Live ammunition fired at a fixed height is poured out above the course. On the ground are people who will gladly explain to anyone who might care to listen the value of all the hard training that has gone before. As the training cycle progresses, the future officer is exposed to some demonstrations of United States Army firepower. days is not a long time really, but it is a beginning, an introduction to army life and to the basic tools and skills of leadership for these college students, future officers of the Reserve Officers Training Corps. 